The Heartbroken Inn is about betrayal within a family. A brother and a sister, a TV producer and a malaria researcher at odds with each other about how best to interpret their late father's legacy. It's really about the 11th commandment, don't get found out. So often in novels, the main woman character comes on and you're straight into her love interest. Now, Beck actually seems to have loads of men falling in love with her, including this incredibly sinister um, editor of a tabloid newspaper. But certainly at the beginning of the novel, although later on she does fall in love, she's not really that bothered. She's ambitious. She really just wants to spend time in her lab coat. Yeah. Were you deliberately working hard to portray a woman character that is passionate about her work, that's passionate about taking risks for her work, or was that something that came quite naturally? Beck's character is, uh, is complex. She is a, uh, a woman who, who loves and, and is ready to, to love um, person to person. Uh, but yes, when you ask about her, her work, that was something I very consciously wanted to do. And, and the more difficult I realized it was to portray a woman at work, uh, the more I wanted to do it because you know, these, these are the challenges uh, of, of being a writer. But yes, it was, it was very interesting to me to find how hard it was to portray uh, a, a woman working, uh, to portray the work itself and, and particularly somehow uh, a woman doing it in this modern age, in 2013, in the here and now. Uh, and, and so I had to come at it from various different angles. I had, I had many stabs at it. Uh, and it, it did seem to work better when I put her in a lab and when I gave her this sort of um, a strange, comical um, introduction uh, to the world of collaborating with other scientists in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, the attempted seduction by the elder scientist and, the, uh, and, and her discovery that, that was to make her career. Um, but yes, how, how strange that should be. It, it really reinforced this idea I have that there's something quite romantic in the old-fashioned sense about the, um, about the novel, as you might expect from its name. Um, you know, it's in, in so many languages, the word for novel is romance. Um, but there's also something quite aristocratic about it. And so many of the classical heroines that we think of in, in literature, it's not just that they uh, seem only to be there in order to fall in love with or to be fallen in love with, uh, to get married or not to get married, but also that they don't really seem to have anything like uh, a job or a, a destiny uh, apart from marriage and love. They don't seem to have that thing which is so normal in a, in a male character, that other horizon that they yearn for in the distance uh, that women so easily fall in love with. So that was what I was trying to, to give back. I think that's fantastically successful. I mean, I think she's a really wonderful heroine. Uh, her brother, meanwhile, is almost kind of Beck's moral inverse, in a way. Isn't it? How did you go about creating Richie? <laughs> uh, it's always great fun to create a, a moral monster. Um, and it's quite, it's sort of in, tw in a twisted way, it's quite gratifying that you can create somebody who is so obnoxious and vile as, as Richie, uh, and yet people seem to, in a way, like him, and almost even though everyone has said that they are sorry that he wasn't punished more, um, at the same time, a lot of people have said that they like him in that way that you like a rogue and you almost want him to get away with it all. Uh, so I think he does arouse this conflicting feeling in people. And I suppose really as a writer, as with any character, but particularly with the villains, you just have to let yourself go and, and be that, that villain and, and give rein to your own worst instincts uh, and think, what would I do if, if I was as selfish as that or if I felt myself so unconstrained by uh, conscience? Or to be more accurate about Richie, if I could find some ingenious way of persuading myself in my head that I was doing the right thing, even though I was only serving my own greed and selfishness. 
I mean, he is. I, I try to make him comical and and foolish, uh, and I suppose in a way that that lightens his uh, his 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 darkness. I um, and it's not the first time that I've created quite a, a big character who is also on the face of it quite unpleasant, uh, but who people seem to seem to warm to. It's a fantastically complex book. Uh, you've got several main characters. You go into the details of their lives from their points of view. You've also got a whole host of minor characters. How did you keep control of them all? It is hard to keep track of so many characters and uh, so many events over the course of a 550-page novel. And yeah. I, you can't do it without some kind of list, some kind of chart, some kind of diagram, extensive notes. Uh, in the end, it was all focused on this one piece of paper where I had every chapter marked out in a grid. I, I wrote this book over four years, so over four years I, I honed this technique down until the size of the squares corresponded to the size of the chapters and the color of the, of the boxes. Uh, corresponded to the uh, the particular character whose point of view the the chapter was being told from. Um, so it, it might sound a little bit mechanical, but it becomes very much um, embedded with the uh, with the with the course of writing the novel. I mean, I, I'm I'm gratified that whatever people have thought of the book, um, everyone who's read it has found it. Uh, they, they, they found it quite hard to put down. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's a sign that, that the, uh, the grid sort of melted completely into, the, into the, the actual thing. I think the, the kind of range of your writing and the kind of fearlessness of it really is quite unusual in what we can loosely call British fiction. I mean, I think in some ways it's more common in America where I think there's more of a tradition of a sort of a big fat narrative which has engaging characters but also has something to say about contemporary society. And the comparison I've drawn um, with your work before is John Irving, who I think is writing these kind of huge wide ranging narratives that are, are very human stories but also have a lot to say. Are you conscious of doing something that in some ways I think is quite brave and unusual in British fiction, or do you not really see yourself in context of sort of what's happening within the novel today? I, I'm a little bit wary of the discourse of um, novelty in uh, in novels, in the sense of some kind of progress, as if literature was like uh, computers getting smaller and smaller and faster and faster. Um, I think there is an enormous amount of room for possible versions of the novel form uh, that have not yet been um, exercised. And I feel very strongly that the, the space, the greater space for experimentation uh, is within a quite conventional surface. In other words, using what appears to be relatively conventional language, not the kind of experimentation you'd see in, in Joyce um, at his most extreme or, or Beckett at his most extreme, but all those variations uh, between Oster and Kurtzea, um and James uh, and Dickens, uh, all those many, many people who are all using uh, relatively conventional sentences but in, in, in so many different ways and that we haven't begun to really plumb the depths uh, of, of uh, ways of expressing the passage of time uh, and the relationship between things and people. Uh, and so, yes, in that sense, I'm, I'm a very, very uh, conscious and thoughtful uh, uh, practitioner of, of, of being a novelist. I'm not just sort of like, um, hey-ho, here we go, here's another book, what's going to happen here then? Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice that you say that it was um, that it was, what was it you said, fearless. Um, I mean, other people might say reckless <laughs> or, or mad. Uh, it, it, it was, it was an ambitious. And I was consciously thinking about 19th century archetypes uh, in the breadth of characters, all knitted together by a single narrator. Uh, 
And I suppose what I was reacting against was a rather lazy reliance, I think, on single point narratives, whether it's first person or um, the, the classic uh, mode these days is, um, is uh, free and direct speech. Uh, and the great practitioners of that are great, great writers. And I will always love Saul Bellow. He's, he's a master. Uh, and, I, and Kurt Sayer is, is, um, is my favorite writer in English today, I think. But um, there are so many more lazy, less thoughtful practitioners who have just followed these examples uh, and end up simply being incredibly solipsistic and, and uh, narrow focused. And there's a tremendous democracy about a, write, a, a book which is told from different points of view. Uh, and though we might think of the 19th century as being a much more autocratic time, uh, a writer who will give voice to many, many different points of view is, I think, uh, de facto a, a more democratic, open writer.